Welcome back to Panda Pen Club. Today I'm going to review the Duke 805 Opera Pen. And there it is, right there on the clip in your godmother's best Christmas card handwriting. Duke 805. We call these opera pens. So do the manufacturers. Why is that? Well, the obvious answer is there are masks associated with Chinese opera on the extremely large cap in between two chrome rings. The question I want to ask in this review is what exactly are these six faces doing here on this pen? What do they mean? In order to understand that, I think the place to begin is where Chinese opera began, which is arguably with Kun Chu opera. Don't imagine Pavarotti. <laughs> on stage when you see the Duke 805, when you see these masks, because you're talking about a different entity entirely. The principles of Kun Chu opera were solidified by a man named Wei Liang Fu in his book Nan Tzu Ying Zhang, which can be translated in a rather marvelously pearl-clutching way into southern tunes sung correctly. And this was published in 1547. And this standardized lots of rules of rhyme and tone for various different regional types of opera, particularly drawing on songs from the town of Kunshan, incorporating those with some rather more forceful elements from northern styles of singing in order to help performers express ardent emotions, and incorporating various refinements as well, such as shui mo jiao, which means water polishing, and refers to a method of voicing each syllable precisely and completely. So the start of the word, the head, releasing the body of the word, and then ending with the tail for each syllable, all drawn out in one smooth transition. <laughs> Kunchu opera was everywhere, like football in the 16th century. It infiltrated every layer of society. It was the main form of popular entertainment in China at that time. Kun Chu opera is the original, the mother of all Chinese operas, and it is the one that spawned Beijing opera in the 19th century. Beijing or Peking opera is the really, really popular one, but in fact there are over 100 regional styles of Chinese opera. However, because Beijing opera is the most popular, the most mainstream, it is the one that this pen is most often associated with. This pen comes in an extraordinarily celebratory and elaborate box. In fact, the pomp and significance of the box this pen comes in feels slightly out of proportion to the pen itself. It feels like a box made for a far larger commemorative fountain pen, such as the Duke 580 or the Hero 8001 or even the Duke 510, any of which I would love to get my hands on. The pen is not huge or chunky is what I'm saying. It's not small either. It's 144 millimeters in length capped, as you see it now, and 36 grams. Uncapped, as you see it now, it's 123.7 millimeters in length and 21 grams. It's metal on lacquer, which is where that weight is coming from. Speaking of the cap, you may have noticed it's a friction fit, which is arguably something you often see in pens that are in the less luxurious category. Although there are a big exceptions to that, like the Lamy 2000. Anyway, I'm not gearing up for a criticism of the pen's appearance because I really rather like it. The main feature is the massive cap band, the Opera Mark. There are six in total, opera masks or the made up faces of six opera performers. And these are set into enamel in the style of cloisonné work. Cloisonné is a surprisingly handy piece of vocabulary. It refers to pieces of enamel or glass separated by flattened wire, with the original French meaning being partition. There's very little staging, scenery, props in Kun Chu. Much of the meaning is conveyed by the gestures of the actors and the manipulation of their characteristically long sleeves. And we can perhaps compare this pared down atmosphere, the darkness of the theatres, from which all these sounds and colours and faces loom, to the silky black lacquer that envelops our pen, culminating in a little dome of unbroken black shiny smoothness and interrupted at the top 
only by this mysterious little chrome nubule. Not only is there little scenery or props to help the audience figure out what's going on, but the language of Kun Chu is rarely understood by those watching because it's a mixture of various dialects and standard Mandarin. So people cannot fully understand what's being said. Also, most of the plays are really, really, really long. Often performances will be spread if you're going to perform an entire piece over several days or various different scenes from lots of different plays. So how does the audience get context? How do they understand what's going on in what they're watching? Well, one way that they do this is through the masks, through the face paint worn by the actors. There are five main roles in Kun Chu. The Cho, or clown, who is often the leader of the troupe of actors. You have the Sheng, or male part. You have the Dan, which is the female part. You also have the Jing, colorful and exuberant character and you have the more an elderly venerable person often a general or a magistrate so the audience recognizes to some extent what's going on from the mask the pa face paint of the actor from the role they're clearly playing and is therefore able to enjoy the performance first and foremost because kun chu opera is all about the performance So we have five role types, and that doesn't neatly explain why we have six masks on the cat band. I think I have identified at least suggestions for what each of these masks could represent, each character and the play that they come from. Starting at number one, I'm calling number one the mask below the clip. Now, I think this is Ma Wu. Ma Wu was a general who helped found the Eastern Han Dynasty, and the opera was the capture of Luo Yang. Number two, Zhou De Wei. Zhou De Wei was the chief of the Pure Pearl Fortress, which was under siege. To end it as quickly as possible, he challenged the enemy general to an archery duel. And when the enemy general shot down two vultures, Zhou De Wei knew that he was beaten and surrendered. Number three, Yu Wen Cheng Du was a general considered the second greatest warrior of the period. And he was part of an army that defeated the occupiers of Nanyang Pass. Number four, Lian Po was a general who apologized to an enemy for arrogance and false dignity. And he did so with a birch rod tied to his back. Number five, this is the most dubious of my little findings. I think this is Pang Tong, who was also known as Feng Cho, which means fledgling phoenix, which is a brilliant thing to be known by. And Pang Tong was a highly effective minor magistrate who lobbied honorably for a more significant role. Number six, Ji Liao was an ambitious and cruel man who dethroned his nephew and he's killed by an assassin posing as a cook at a banquet. And the, the way the assassin kills him is he brings him a fish to eat and he's got a knife hidden inside the fish. And he proceeds from there. And this opera is called The Dagger in the Fish. Six masks, six meanings. Have I got them right? Not sure. Now, my thinking is that these pens are produced as a nod of respect to the tenacity of these art forms. Kunshu opera in particular is just a harrowing example, a once pervasive art form that has been essentially waterboarded by 200 years of history. In the 19th century, it was already being sidelined to some extent by Beijing opera, but it came under serious threat of actual extinction following the treaty that ended the Opium Wars in 1842, in which Britain extracted onerous terms from China that essentially allowed Britain to continue making vast amounts of wealth from importing and selling opium drugs in China. In the aftermath of this 1842 treaty, there were at least four major rebellions caused by the anti-foreigner sentiment that resulted from this treaty. One of these rebellions, the Taiping Rebellion, which lasted from 1850 to 1864, and annihilated the patronage base of Kunshu Opera in Suzhou. The grounding for this already somewhat threatened art form was swept away. At the end of the 19th century, there's only one troop in Suzhou. These are mostly elderly people, some of whom are addicted to opium. Now, efforts by some horrified and luckily rather wealthy citizens resulted in a movement of singing clubs in that region in the early 20th century. And this effort culminated in 1921 with the founding of the School for the Perpetuation of Kun Chu. Then, of course, we have the Japanese invasion, the occupation of this region of China, and World War II. By the end of World War II, 21 actors that were educated by this school survived. 
21, and we have the Cultural Revolution, which lasted until 1976. We have actors being sent to the countryside for re-education. During the Cultural Revolution, only eight modern revolutionary model plays were produced in China. With the end of the Cultural Revolution, we have the actors recalled from the countryside, and we have only 16 actors who had been educated at the School for the Perpetuation of Kun Chu surviving. In 1981, the city of Suzhou tried to promote Kun Chu opera, and one of the main purposes was to gather the now nine remaining actors from this school so they could pass on the artistic tradition. 1987, the opening up of China, and we have a vast influx of Western culture and young people overwhelmingly preferring Western culture and ideas. This has been an art form under siege. It's been assailed by direct violence and more subtle forms of subversion, oppression, and diminishment. Now, solving the conundrum of preserving this cultural heritage was helped somewhat by UNESCO, which in 2001 listed Kun Chu as one of the intangible cultural treasures of humanity. Whether these are Beijing opera masks or Kun Chu opera masks on this pen, I have no idea. Whether I have correctly identified roles, the historical figures they represent, I have no idea. Either way, it's fascinating to me to think about the sort of statement that a manufacturer is making by producing a pen that is emblazoned with these masks. And it's fascinating to me to think about what it means for me or anyone to carry around a pen emblazoned with these masks and the history that it evokes. It seems absolutely everything is political, including pens. Now, to perpetuate a tradition, let's move on to the writing sample for the Duke. Cap is friction fit. Sometimes I find myself turning the cap and occasionally unturning the section, unscrewing it from the shaft, which is a slightly irritating thing. I would say it's one of the only things that have irritated me about this pen. So we'll let it off. The Duke 805. And you probably saw there, it's just a little hard to get it to start. This is a steel nib 0.5 millimeters as with all dukes it writes with this lovely combination of velvety friction and smoothness i have this loaded with the amine majestic blue and i'm writing on clairefontaine paper which i can't spell reliably any day of the week a degree of dryness with this pen there you can see it on the horizontal lines lovely Panda, six, jinxed, zebra, four, quick, game of whist. There are slight problems with the ink flow on this very small nib. I believe I've got this one for RMB 58. But that was on Taobao in China. I have seen it today on AliExpress for $15 or thereabouts. For me, the writing experience with this pen is really nice. I always love Duke nibs. I don't want to sell it down because of its slight dryness, its propensity to start a little, with a little difficulty. As you can see, now it's going, off we go, no trouble. It's a lovely little pen and it's well priced sometimes. If you can get it at a good price and or you're interested by the history it alludes to, I strongly recommend this pen. I adore this pen. I'm a huge fan. If you enjoyed watching this video, please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to Panda Pen Club on YouTube. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.